All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Logan Christian, and I am the Region 2 Conservation Advocate for Mountain Lion Foundation. We're excited to discuss a very important topic for today's webinar, one that is relevant to anyone interested in the conservation of not only mountain lions, but all wildlife. As we know, human activity continues to fragment wildlife habitat, and roads are one of the biggest contributors to this problem, killing millions of animals in the United States every single year. Now, while roads continue to widen and expand into new places, wildlife are also encountering them more often as drought and wildfire, as well as extreme weather, forces species to move in new patterns and places. While roads are likely here to stay, wildlife crossings are a relatively new tool that can reconnect landscapes and habitat in our human-dominated world. Now, joining me for today's webinar is Dr. Patricia Kramer, an independent wildlife scholar and an expert on the topic of wildlife connectivity, corridors, and crossings. For the past 18 years, she has researched wildlife crossing structures and worked to include wildlife concerns in the transportation planning process with the goal of reducing wildlife vehicle collisions while also promoting wildlife connectivity across landscapes. Her research projects include three national level projects and work with over four, with 14 departments of transportation, mainly in the Western United States. Dr. Kramer earned her PhD from the University of Florida in wildlife conservation, a master's degree from Montana State University in wildlife ecology, and an undergraduate degree in wildlife from State University of New York, College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry. So I am particularly excited for today's webinar with Dr. Kramer um, on a personal level. Our families actually knew each other back when she was working at Utah State University and I was growing up in Northern Utah. Um, so it's very exciting to be reconnecting. Additionally, Dr. Kramer is currently involved in the development of a wildlife corridor action plan. Um, in fact, I think it's mostly wrapped up for New Mexico, which is a state that I work closely in. And she's been involved in corridor planning processes in many other states where Mountain Lion Foundation works. So we are so glad to have her on today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Kramer, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for that very generous introduction. Of course, so before we jump in, as usual, we will ask that our participants hold off on asking questions until the end, but please do write down or keep in mind any of the questions that you have. Um, we're gonna spend the first 45 to 50 minutes hearing from Dr. Kramer. And then I look forward to hearing many questions from the audience at the end. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Sure. So Dr. Kramer, I would love to start just by hearing a bit more about your background, um, maybe including what first interested you in studying wildlife connectivity as well as corridors. Sure, sure. Oh, it's so fun to see the slideshow. Um... You know, it's, it's really interesting as you get older, you start to realize how many lives you've lived in the, in the time you've been on this earth. And I start thinking about the different decades and trying to remember way back then. Um, I really loved biogeography when I started studying um, in the, at the graduate level. And I started thinking about this idea, how do animals move on the landscape and realize connectivity was really important. And so that was... Um, back in the late eight, mid to late eight, 1980s, and we started understanding more about how animals need to move across the landscape. So um, I, um, I started thinking that's, that's what I want to do. And um, I, I finished up my master's, which was working with small mammals in old growth in Montana. And then I wanted to model connectivity because we started getting more information from GPS collars. Excuse me, in those days it was radio collars on animals and also uh, computer modeling. And so that's how I started to be able to predict where we think animals need to go and what lands do we need to protect? Because I think that's really important to not only, in fact, I think the Nature Conservancy learned this lesson about the same time too, is not only protect land that are the opportunity like, oh, this came for sale, let's protect it, but target specifically where wildlife need those connections, both for their habitat and to get to the different ranges that they use. Great. So you, I know, did some of your earlier research on the Florida panther, and I'd just be curious to hear a little bit more about that research as well. Sure, sure. Um, it was real interesting back in, I'm trying to remember, <laughs> what, what, what was that other century? Uh, 92, I started my uh, PhD work at the University of Florida, and um, 
I became a modeler. And in those days, it, it was pretty rare. And I created all my own coding with C++ as a code that we used to create a model that mimicked um, virtual panthers moving on the landscape to predict whose land was most important. And um, it, when an animal's really rare, like a Florida panther, like there was less than 200 of them, and there were none of them in North Florida where I was living and where I was focusing, um, you want to you want to make sure that when you reintroduce a species to some place that it, it you're not going to just drop them off and they all die because you didn't pre prepare them or prepare the way for them. So my my work with the Florida panther was using my model to predict whose land was most important, and then working with those landowners or agencies um, to allow panthers to live on the landscape. So I predicted places um, with my model where they would live and move in um, Northern Florida. And un unfortunately, there still are no uh, panthers reintroduced there largely because of the human component of, of the whole thing. They, they could easily live there. Um, we've got vast swatches of um, um, Osceola National Forest and Okefenokee Swamp, et cetera, but um, it, it comes down to the people again. But that's, that's how I began my work predicting where we need to protect the land and work with landowners for wildlife. So that's interesting. It sounds like, you know, a lot of that er early research was looking at corridors and connectivity across the whole landscape. And at some point you started kind of focusing really on wildlife crossings. Is that, um, could you kind of tell us a little bit about the roles that you've had over the course of your career and, and um, as they relate to not only just the connectivity, but wildlife crossings in particular? Sure, sure. So, um, I have the uh, the wonderful um, blessing to um, be passionate about what I do and find work in what I do, and the money follows. I so what I'm saying is I don't do things for money, but thank God I do have found a way to make some money doing it. And so yeah, I was very passionate. Trade. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so um, uh, when I was in grad school at the University of Florida, there's a prairie. It's a wet prairie south of town called Paynes Prairie. And uh, well-known herpetologists were seeing decimation of, of snake uh, and, and amphibian populations on a couple of different highways that go through there. And so we as uh, scientists got together voluntarily and um, we went in with the mantra, which is still my mantra, the DOT is our friend, we will not embarrass them in front of anyone, and ask them to please put in wildlife crossing structures in Payne's Prairie State Preserve. So, that was my introduction to this world, and um, we, we succeeded. Um, we learned how to reach out to politicians and get people to write letters to the editor. Um, and we got four additional wildlife crossings underneath U441, um, and they were great for alligators, otters, um, all kinds of animals to move underneath instead of going up. And we also had a one foot, excuse me, a one meter or three foot tall um, concrete barrier along the road kind of sunken down below the level of the road so you can't even see it to keep the animals from going up and over. And it was very successful. Um, and so that was my beginning. And then um, how I wound up having crossroads with the Christian family was um, uh, for my postdoc work, which is after you graduate from the PhD, you still have more hoops to jump through. I uh, wound up going to Utah State University under um, John Bissonette, who was the USGS co-op unit leader there to do a national study. And that really, it was the first time I was in the right place at the right time, standing on the shoulders of giants before me. And I was able to do a national level project where I got to know what everyone was doing across the country and then promote wildlife crossings at a national level throughout the country. And that was in the early 2000s. Okay, interesting. So yeah, and that, I, I'm curious to hear more about that at some point too, sort of what were some of those broader lessons looking across what was happening. Um, maybe before we get there, too, I would love to hear a little bit more about this major problem in wildlife conservation, which is wildlife vehicle collisions. Um, I think we we all kind of understand that that is a major problem both for wildlife and people. Um, but could you kind of give us a sense for how prolific that problem is um, and its impacts on both humans and wildlife? Sure. So when we talk about wildlife vehicle collisions, it's a phenomenon. And Specific to exactly what we mean, basically the deals with wildlife getting hit and people um, getting hurt. So, uh, Logan, just let me know if my um, if um, you can't hear me if the break up over the the lines and I'll shut my video off and it'll improve it. 
Okay, you could, your um, kind of, your image is a little choppy, but we're hearing you just fine. So I'll let, let you know. Okay, great, great. So there's this, this the phenomenon of vehicle collisions. And within that, we have wildlife vehicle conflict, which is the words we're trying to use now, which is this problem of not only the animals getting killed on the road, but animals not even crossing the road because there's too much traffic. We're not able to get over through the fences, the right of way fences, the fragmentation, pollutants, et cetera. So there's conflict, there's collision, and crash data, which are reported who call, um, uh, say, they get off Jersey's deputies to come. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Kramer. We are getting a little bit of choppiness. Um, so if you want to shut off your okay. video, I understand uh, Dr. Kramer is in a rainstorm in Florida right now. So there could be some, some connectivity issues. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Another connectivity. Yeah. So you can look at the pictures from my research on the screen with a whole bunch for you. Um, that wolf in Montana, by the way, it's pretty rare using structure, but they do. Um, while crashes are recorded by the police officers, one well, that they're not always reported by the trucks or 18 wheelers because uh, there's very little danger. They are the the um, drivers are usually penalized for having a crash. So um, it's a very incomplete database, but it's the best database. I, in the work I'm doing right now, I censused every single DOT in the country to find out how many crashes they have. So I'll give you some numbers for the number geeks. Um, there's wildlife vehicle crashes, which we know a wild animal was involved. And then there's animal vehicle crashes, which could include dogs, cats, cows, and horses. There's about a dozen states that don't delineate between the two types. So I'm going to give you numbers that refer to animal vehicle crashes. Um, there's 347,000 crash reported each year in the United States. The majority are in the Midwest, um, where there's a lot of white hair. And if you look at all the different regions of the country, the least number are in the Western states, yet the folks that are making the most wildlife crossings. Um, give you some more numbers. There's a cost to each type of crash. So if it's just property damage only, it's a few thousand. But if someone's killed, it's worth millions because that person's life has a value. And so I tabulated all the averages for all the states. And um, it averages 10.1 billion, that's with a B, million, $10 billion a year on average for animal vehicle crashes using federal highway crash values. So it's very expensive. There's 201 uh, crashes reported every year with animals across the country. So uh, it is not just a, a, a toll on the wildlife, but there's also a toll for the humans that get involved in these crashes. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like it's, it's a major problem. And, um, you know, there have been a variety of, of proposals and ways to address this. And I think the one that's, of course, gained some more steam recently is uh, the idea of actually physically helping wildlife get over roads. Um, I think most folks have seen a wildlife crossing. Um, you're seeing some pictures, especially of underpasses right now. Um, but how long have these structures been around as a tool for reducing wildlife vehicle collisions? And were there any particular areas where they were first implemented sort of as a proof of concept? Sure. Well, some of you may have been around and remember um, President Eisenhower's um, interstate push in around 1964. The great interstate highway uh, system was born. And so when those highways started going in, they started seeing wildlife habitat, especially to west, but also north to south. And some of people um, who were very cognizant of how it was going to affect wildlife said, hey, wait a minute, we need to put crossing structures in, even before they were invented in our, in our country. So in 1975, the first underpass that I could find, and again, I did three years of research, um, it's understood was in Vail Path on I-70 in Colorado. It was a box culvert like you're seeing here from Mule Deer. And the first wildlife overpass was over Interstate 15, Utah, which you'll see some pictures of in here. Um, this is the Utah red right now we're going through. And so 1975 was the beginning of wildlife crossings. 
Okay. Um, across the country, for sure. And then um, they increased over time, and they, they kind of dropped off in the early 1990s. Um, and I'm not sure if we'll talk about it now, but we, we started using cameras to see what, how they really worked, and that helped them start to increase more over time. Okay. So <clears throat> was there any initial skepticism about these? I, I know that they've kind of more recently started gaining popularity. Were, were folks not as interested at, at first at, at doing this? Because I think when you first see it, it's like, would wildlife ever want to travel across something like that? Yes. Um, you always have to, and I, I, I have no problem with this at all. You always have to prove yourself, which, you know, we should, we should have, if we're going to spend taxpayer funds, we want the people who want those funds spent to prove that they work, that whatever we're asking for is working. So kind of prove to the world that users with 35 millimeter cameras with film, because you could only get maybe 36 pictures over a period of time. And we did tra uh, track beds with sand to show that there were some, but sheer numbers um, was hard to show. So around 2004, the remote cameras that we are using today became available in a very limited way. And um, the researchers like myself, I, I didn't start till 2007 using those cameras. We were able to show the departments of transportation, look how many hundreds of times or even thousands of times Mule deer, elk, porcupine, mountain lions, bear, look at all these animals going through these structures. Look, they're working. And then it just really took off. So I, I spent 15 years in, in Utah. Um, yeah, about 15 years doing research for Utah, which you see here um, is some of these pictures. And several years into it, I would say somewhere around from 2007 to maybe 2012, um, I would go to, well, I, I, I went for over 10 years um, to U, UDOT, Utah DOT conference, and I showed pictures. And it was the, the big hit at the conference to show these great pictures of how well the work did. And one of the, one of the planners came up to me. Um, I didn't know him at the time, but he said, you, it was just a wonderful experience. He said, you asked us to build more wildlife crossing structures. And we didn't know if they worked. And when you showed us all those pictures and movies of the animals using the structures, then we realized they did. And we started building more. And he said, you made a difference. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is like one thing we all want to hear is someone tells you, you made a difference. So the cameras and the technology that we used to prove they worked really changed the tide in the 2010 to 2015 range. And of course, today as well. Yeah, that's that's definitely understandable. I think even just looking at these photos here, that's what really excites you about this project is, you know, you see you see wildlife actually moving through these structures and it becomes pretty clear, you know, that's an animal that wasn't directly on the roadway. So um, I see why that's a powerful example. Um, now I want to I want to talk more about your work specifically. So you've you've worked in over a dozen states. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about those efforts? What are some of the wildlife crossing plans or projects that you've been involved with? And what did you contribute to those efforts? Sure, I'm gonna, I'll just keep putting my video on and off. Just keep letting me know if it's a problem. Um, well, let me tell you about like cresting a wave um, and being part of a new technology. I'm an entrepreneur in the sense that I have to come up with my own um, work. I don't have an employer. And so I'm always looking ahead what's next. And so the way this field worked is very similar to any kind of new technology or a science. This is, this is part of the science of ecology that's developing. And at first, the, fir the early years, say from 2000 to 2018, the majority of our work was researching the wildlife crossing structures with the cameras to see what worked for different species. Um, you see a lot of pictures of large animals, but people are also looking at, the, does it work for salamanders and toads and turtles, which is a little different. And so all these years we've been looking at saying, okay, this is what elk will do, which we'll get into bighorn, pronghorn, et cetera. And it, it really is species specific. And also um, we are learning that animals that live with people in an urban suburban area are much more willing to go through long, dark tunnels <clears throat> compared to the animals that are in a wild landscape who want a very short structure and very open so that they don't have to worry about a puma or mountain lion um, being there to get them or, or a person with a gun. 
So um, that was all these years uh, we, we, we had the cameras out and we, everybody loved all the pictures and, and everything we did. Then the next phase, what we started to do more of was, was map where the crashes are happening to look at hotspots. Because what we want to do now is not, again, I, I said this from the beginning of my career, is not blast out all the money, but to prioritize where it should go. And so we needed to prioritize or show the DOTs where the problems were. So I've been um, spending since 2013, so about 10 years, um, looking at um, creating maps of where the hot spots are for crashes with wildlife or the carcasses that people pick up. So we've been using GIS to map locations. Then what's happening now is um, we want to change the way the Departments of Transportation plan, and we want wildlife to be part of that planning process. In fact, Logan, um, am I correct? You are in Utah right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so Spencer Cox, the, the governor, just signed this past week um, a, a bill that says that the DOT in their annual reports has to report on what they're doing for wildlife mitigation. And there's a lot of other great things going on in Utah as well. And so what we're seeing is they need to, what the DOTs need is to see where their priority areas are with, with hotspot mapping, but also corridor mapping, which we can get into. And then they need to do something about it. And so my work now is incorporating how wildlife get into the planning process early on, not, not just mm. before the project starts, and how to direct the DOT efforts to do that. So that's as my wave crested on the research, the next wave I'm doing is the planning part. And then from there, um, with some of the funding we'll talk about in the future, I can see this really happening um, across the country quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, that's really exciting to see it kind of progress. And I think one of the cool things about your career, especially, is that you've sort of seen this through its, its many different phases, and now it's coming to a head a little bit more. Um, and now, I think we've talked a bit about how you know, Department of Transportations, those are definitely entities that are almost always involved in these plans that, that you're working on. Um, are they usually the ones initiating the plan? And, and what are some of the other entities that get involved, um, including like the role of state wildlife agencies? Right, Since right. Very good question, Logan. Um, that's one of the one of my life's goals. And I, I try uh, try to um, go to the wildlife agencies and tell them, hey, guys, they need your help. You need to be proactive. So I'll go to like state wildlife agency meetings. I'll go to the national level wildlife society meetings and um, have a symposium of, of a whole bunch of people to show how it's done. So um, one of the things that we see is some legislation to get things rolling, um, but sometimes that legislation, um, in fact, rarely does that legislation ever have anything to fund these extra duties for these wildlife professionals or, or the DOT professionals. So it's very, very important if you are working with a wildlife agency in any way, or even if you're not, they are the key to help apply some pressure and give lots of support to the DOT about who they should be looking out for and where they should be looking out for it, and then bring that into the planning process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I think oftentimes, probably most of the time, it's the wildlife agencies that have a lot of the data um, that you would need to do some of these, these planning processes. So that makes a lot of sense. Are, I think that's actually a good transition into this question. Are, what are some of the species that are commonly prioritized in planning of wildlife corridors and crossings? Are there, you know, and, and also are there any reasons why some species might be prioritized over other species? Sure, so let me give you a, a continuum, having been around a while, of knowing what, how you start and, and how it progresses in, in a state or a province in say Canada. So initially, the wildlife crossing structures are built in a state for the larger animals that could um, really hurt someone in an accident. So that's going to be your, your deer, your elk, and your moose, occasionally your bighorn sheep. Then the other part of it is the Fish and Wildlife Service gets involved and it's that they say, you know, I know you want to reconstruct that highway and add another two lanes to it, but you know what? We've got an endangered species of something and you're going to need to put in a wildlife crossing structure for it. Um, and mountain lion species, a subspecies, the Florida panther, was very instrumental in getting Florida's wildlife crossing structures. Florida was the leader in creating wildlife crossing structures from, from the beginning all the way into about 2015. 
And it was because the Florida Panther, its presence in South Florida, where all the development was going on, was able to be used by the Fish and Wildlife Service to say, you need to put in wildlife crossing structures for this endangered subspecies of mountain lion. So um, I'm also finding, I did a national survey um, two years ago, um, asking all the DOT wildlife people, what are you even putting crossings in for? And it's real interesting is in the Eastern states, it's again, the Fish and Wildlife Service saying, you've got an indigo snake, you've got this endangered species of turtle or tortoise, um, you've got to put in a structure. So that's how they start. And then when, oh, the other one too, I, I should mention Texas because the, the first structures were for ocelots. So again, they have lots of deer there, but it was the Fish and Wildlife Service at, at the Atascosa uh, National Wildlife Refuge saying, put them in for the ocelot. So you start out with that, and then I've seen it over and over again. In fact, um, in the in a Texas movie that uh, we saw a, a clip from, uh, one of the engineers I worked with there said, you know, we found that we could do it. It wasn't that hard. My kids got to see what a great job we did and how we saved the wildlife. We got great publicity. And we're like, oh, we'll do this some more. So then you see it, um, a State Department of Transportation start doing structures for smaller animals um, that are not necessarily endangered. They enlarge culverts so that fish can get through the natural flow of the water and, and it's not a it's not a, a culvert that's perched a high and the water's dripping down and, and the fish can't get up so they bring it down for natural flow. I've had fish um, passage biologists in Washington state um, realize that the, the fish passage they're going to put in oh we can just enlarge it for a couple thousand dollars more to include terrestrial pathways along the way I monitored and there you go deer were walking through it as long as with other animals so it's a, it's a mindset that the initial big animals and endangered species start the process, and then we get them starting to realize that we can start doing this for many, many species without a very difficult time or not a lot of money. So again, that goes to the work I did initially with the Florida panther. You want that um, umbrella species, you, and that's why mountain lions are so great for this, is that they if you can get them across the landscape. Because a mountain, if a mountain lion walks 10, 20 miles in a night, that's a lot of roads they have to cross no matter where they are. So if you can find the places they need to move, then the animals that have similar ecological needs or, you know, it's not going to be a desert tortoise. It's not going to necessarily do the same thing. But if you can put in structures for mountain lions to help them get across the landscape, you help a whole plethora of the ecosystem of great blue herons and and sandhill cranes and, and fish and turtles. And it's amazing how it really can blossom to much more than just those initial species. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. And it, as you were kind of answering that, it seems like there's all sorts of different factors at play. You have endangered species, you have you know, the, the actual size of the animal and, and how frequently they're on roads because that has implications for how often people get hurt and, and get in crashes. You know, you have all these other factors. So since since funding is so limited, are there when you're when you're developing these plans for wildlife crossings, um, what kind of what kind of factors go into not only identifying where those corridors should be and where those crossings should be, but also prioritizing them and saying, you know, this is the one that we absolutely should be funneling resources to. Maybe these ones are slightly less important, at least for now. How do you kind of go through that process? Well, believe it or not, the, the most the <sighs> There's very few wildlife crossing structures built in the United States that were standalone projects just for wildlife. To give you an example, though, there's a great one on Interstate 70 at its very western end in Utah, where it hits Interstate 15. The, the, the engineers in that district within UDOT were able to build a standalone wildlife crossing structure uh, on mile post five. Um, but most of the time, the priorities wind up being when's the next project coming up. So um, the, the big the big shiny objects that the, the, the journalists and the uh, movie makers like to jump on are the big projects where a road's typically two lane to four lane or um, climbing lanes or you know 10 miles or more. And then we jump in and say, wait, wait, if you're thinking about that, then let's put in some bridges for wildlife. And so that's how the priorities are typically been set is what are the upcoming um, projects in the State Transportation Improvement Plan, or STIP, every state has one. We look at that, your wildlife agency looks at it, advocates like yourselves can look at it and say, hey, you know what? 
there's a problem here or we know that wildlife need to get to the other side of the road. When you put that project in, can you, can you change that culvert? Can you upgrade it to a bridge or can you put a bridge over here where the water flows? Or, you know, this is where the elk need to move. You know, this is how we get our projects typically mm. is on, on, on uh, upcoming transportation projects. But my goal and part of my mission is to say, let's create standalone wildlife projects and the long-term plans based on all this data, which is what you're getting to, Logan. And that's based on crash data. It's based on movement data, um, habitat, um, species of special concern, the wildlife action plan within a state where we've got public land or where the private land people are willing to put a conservation easement on it and get the wildlife through. So there are lots of factors that go into it, but we've been very opportunistic. We need to be a little bit more proactive and planning for where we tell them where to put their next project a little bit more. Right, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that just kind of made me realize, so there's there's a, quite a bit of variation in what these crossing structures tend to look like. And I know this is backtracking a little bit, but um, you know, when, when you're going in to update a freeway system or a highway system and these plans that you mentioned, um, are there are there opportunities often to just do smaller fixes that might not be as you know flashy as building a full bridge over a road? But um, is that kind of the more common way that these crossing structures get get implemented? And what are some of those different smaller scale uh, structures that you might use? Sure. So one of the a good word to learn from our our talk today is the word retrofit. And so. Um, that is the cheapest thing to do, and it makes people happy that they can do something um, that doesn't cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So what New Mexico in particular has done a lot of, because um, I, I just, I'm literally jumping out of a New Mexico summit and going back to it after this meeting. Um, New Mexico has done a lot of placing eight foot high wildlife exclusion fence to existing structures that are large enough to accommodate mule deer. And that you wind up just with the cost of the fence. So I'll give you an example in Utah, um, back in 2009, the ARA, the American Recovery Act, UDOT got $900,000 to put three miles of fence up on Interstate 80 between Lake City and Park City, excuse me, Salt Lake City and Park City. We were trying to get the animals to go to interchanges where people are getting off the highway and going to rural roads. I put cameras up and it turns out it didn't work very well because it was too much noise and too much going on. We learned. So then, uh, as you know, uh, Logan, um, then more fence has been added to that and a great overpass has been added to that um, up in the par uh, Park City area to channel the animals to an overpass. So um, one of the things learning from my research is that just because you have an interchange and it goes under the highway, it doesn't mean you're gonna get a moose or some animal to go under it. There's just too many cars and too much noise. So we are definitely looking to help the DOTs retrofit semi-wild areas where it's it's a stream and there's no road going underneath and that's where the animals go. The other cheaper ways are to say, um, um, ups, we call it upsizing a culvert so that if the culvert's just there for drainage, we can say, hey, can you just make that culvert, instead of making a two footer, can you make it a five footer um, so that more animals can go through? Because badgers use them regularly and mountain lions and even black bears if it's big enough. So. Um, those are some of the ways that you can ask for small details that don't cost a lot of money that can really help wildlife in upcoming projects. That makes a lot of sense. So you've now done this in so many different states. You're, you're currently involved in, in planning processes. What are some of the big lessons that you've learned now that you've gone through this process in, in so many different states? Mm -hmm. well, I'll tell you some of the things I'm learning from my uh, current research. So I, I as, a, as, a, as an independent scholar, I juggle all different projects all at the same time. And thank goodness, I only have one right now, but um, I'll, I'll be looking for some more in the future. And I, this one I do right now, I'm finishing up, is a pooled fund study where about a dozen DOTs put money together in a pot that Federal Highways controls. And then they put out um, a request for proposals to look at certain things. And the part that I won was looking at how to incorporate wildlife into planning. And I did a national survey asking these people, like I mentioned earlier, what is stopping your DOT, and we did the Canada, Canadian Ministries of Transportation, from getting more wildlife crossings in? And so one of, some of the lessons learned is, number one, I, I, I'm not sure if I, I, carrots and sticks. I mean, it's so funny. I was like, how can I make this real easy? Carrots and sticks 
and there was another one I'll think about in a moment here, but if people have rewards for doing a good thing for wildlife, you can get them to do something. If they have regulations, if they have legislation that says you have to do something, they'll do it. So that was really important. Oh, the other part is money. Um, and so, so money, carrots, and sticks are the really important three take-home messages to get more. So the carrots are now in the bilateral infrastructure law that was signed by President Biden in November. And just this week, yesterday, my Federal Highways contact said they got the money for the Wildlife Crossings Program. So it's $350 million for specifically for wildlife mitigation. The states will compete for it. So they are rewarded money for the best projects. So um, I think the first year will be about 50 or 60 million for all the states to compete with. That's the carrot. Then some of the sticks that are going on are legislation that's happening within individual states that are saying, listen, we want wildlife corridors action plans. We want um, me memoranda of understanding between the wildlife agency and the DOT to work together. And several other things are going on. So those are my lessons that I'm learning is people need incentives. It's almost like those of you that are teachers can totally understand. They need, just like kids, you need incentives and then you need, um, you need a, a, something from on high saying you need to do this and then um, an, a, a reward uh, for doing it. So that's, that's really important. But the other thing I do is when I show my slideshows, I use a quote from Margaret Mead and it, it means so much over and over again. It, and, it, and if you could think about this, never doubt the power of a few individuals to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And that I find this over and over again when I work with the state, it's less than 10 people that make it happen. If you can get someone that's a little bit higher in the hierarchy of an agency in the DOT to say, yeah, that's a good idea, let's build that structure, you can get whole bunches of things. And I have people on my teams that were um, higher up within the Montana Department of Transportation and they made so much happen in Montana, but sometimes those good people don't get to stick around and the DOT's backslide or the pendulum swings, whatever you wanna call it, and that's another lesson I've learned um, is that for your listeners, for the people that are listening and watching this um, presentation, stay on the DOT, stay on your legislators, stay on your wildlife agency people. What we find is these big, wonderful projects on these highways that you could probably, I won't mention any to, to, to single out anyone, but we get projects 10, 15 miles long. We get like 12 wildlife crossing structures. Everybody's happy. The state wins awards. And everybody walks away, but then the maintenance people have to keep up with the fences and they need to be rewarded for that or reminded. And then you have to make this part and parcel of doing business all the time. And so um, one, of the, one of the things I hope for the future is that this is the way we do business. So um, I'll give an example of, of a great way of doing business in Minnesota. They have a lot of water. And for years I've asked them, hey, can you tell me how many wildlife crossing structures you have? And they're like, we don't know anymore because it's just the way we do business. Every time the engineers build a new bridge, they build it big enough to accommodate a lot of water and they have terrestrial pathways for wildlife or they go from culverts to bridges or just on and on and on. And so that's my goal right. is to go from that, the early continuum I talked about to doing businesses as for the environment and ecology and wildlife as the way you do for everything else. So. <laughs> This might not be an easy question to answer, but what, how did Minnesota get to that point? Like, what was it that made it so that now it's just baked into the planning process? Uh, sticks. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, I, a friend who we just awarded in uh, one of my international conference on ecology and transportation, we awarded Peter Lee an award for being an innovator. He just retired from Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And when the... The state DOT wants to pull a permit to do something in a place where there's water. They have to confer with him to say, hey, are our plan's good enough. And he'll review the plans and he'll, he'll go in and say, hey, you know, we've got a better design over here for X, Y, and Z. Do it this way and you can get your permit. So if people that are concerned about wildlife and ecology have some, some degree of say and control that if the project can get done, then those, those sticks really help get to get the process going as just a matter of doing business instead of something out, unusual and out of the box. 
That's really interesting. Yeah. And I think a lot of folks here are interested in what are those levers, you know, what are those push points where we can get involved in this? So um, it's good that you're identifying some of those for us. I, I want to pivot a little bit. I know a lot of folks on this uh, call understandably care about mountain lions um, and other large carnivores. Uh, we have folks from Caltrans actually on the, the webinar today who are Hi. working on a major project um, in the Santa Monica Mountains, one of the largest wildlife crossings, multi-million dollar. Um, and it's in large part being designed for uh, mountain lions as well as other species. So <clears throat> I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what some of those unique considerations are when you're siting and designing wildlife crossings for mountain lions um, as well as other large carnivores. Some of those unique, what was it when designing? I wasn't sure. Um, some, some of the considerations that go in or what you, you know, what kind of, of um, things do you have to think about when you're trying to encourage mountain lions to move over these kind of structures? Well, I love mountain lions and, you know, they were the animal I studied for my PhD. So uh, I know a little bit about them. Mountain lions, Puma concolor, are the most widely distributed mammal in the Western hemisphere from the Tierra del Fuego in the Argentina and the tip of South America, all the way to the Yucatan territory. There's 13 subspecies of mountain lion. They will hang out in forests. They will, um, they will be in vegetable fields. They will be in your backyard. They will sleep on porches. They will come down and hike your hiking trail with you. So they're very, very adaptable animals as many of you know. The couple of things, how mountain lions play into wildlife crossing structures. As I mentioned earlier, when they're rare, when any species is rare and beloved, like mountain lions are in certain places, you get wildlife crossings for them, as you see in California. Um, and the, of course, the Florida panther in Florida. So mountain lions are, have been behind some of the most numerous wildlife crossings in, in the country in Florida. And now they're behind um, the most expensive and largest wildlife overpass um, in the world. So mountain lions play a critical role in wildlife crossing structures. And the funny thing is they'll use almost anything. So um, in the work that I've done in the Western states, we find that they like enclosed spaces a little bit more than the prey species do. So we've got mountain lions using culverts that a deer would never go through because they're afraid of mountain lions. So if you wanna get a wildlife crossing for mountain lions, they like cover nearby because they are ambush predators. And any predator, this is really important to any predator that comes near a road, if it's seen by people driving on the road, it is in great danger of being shot. There's so many people out there in the world that are willing to poach and kill animals out of season and illegally. So if you can get an, a crossing structure that you want mountain lions to use, they want to be able to approach it and leave it without, without being seen by people on the road. Um, but they will use culverts. You can, you know, if you talk to wildlife researchers, sometimes when they're ready to tag an animal, it's sleeping in the culvert. Um, but they do use overpasses. We have them pictures of them using overpasses in Utah and Colorado. Um, and they do follow the deer. So uh, places where you've got a lot of uh, prey species, you're going to see them as well. Um, the only state that I've worked in, <clears throat> I have not worked in California lately. I did come to California to help cite and talk about that new wildlife crossing structure that Caltrans is putting in, but I've not been employed. Um, but the dozen or so states in the West that I've been employed in. Um, New Mexico is the only state that I'm aware of, again, I don't know everything, um, that specifically said we want structures for mountain lions. So the Wildlife Corridors Action Plan of New Mexico is based on the Wildlife Corridors Act in New Mexico. The state legislators, in conjunction with some of you on the call, um, they said there's six targets Species. So they had mule deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and pronghorn, the four ungulates, and then they had mountain lions and black bear. And so um, uh, I have, I brought in lots of, I was the principal investigator, the person in charge of this big project, and a big, huge 718 page report, if you care to read it. And I chose, uh, and the team chose um, Sandia to Jemez Mountains north of Albuquerque as a corridor to get animals across um, US 550 and then Interstate 25. And data from collared mountain lines showed exactly where the mountain lines needed to cross, Interstate 25 in particular. And so we told New Mexico DOT and the world, um, this is where you need to put a bridge, a 
culvert, retrofit the existing bridges with fence, and help these animals get underneath the road because the mountain lions and black bear have actually been killed in these places. So that's just an example, <clears throat> excuse me, of if you get at the legislative level like Wildlands Network does, put the mountain lion in, in, the, in the, um, the wording of the legislation that they should be considered as well. Otherwise, they're more opportunistic and will we'll follow the deer where they go. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I think New Mexico is a great example. We can post a link to that plan that you're talking about um, in the chat here shortly. Um, I do want to get to one question that is kind of burning for, for us here at Mountain Lion Foundation. We're starting to think a lot more about this, and I'm sure others are too. Um, but how is climate change sort of affecting the need for or even the siting of wildlife crossings? And maybe if you also want to talk a little bit just about whether planners are starting to think about that more and how they could think about that more in these planning processes. <laughs> So you can use that to your advantage when you're asking a DOT to build a larger structure than they normally would. This is, and I've been doing this for decades and, and I was happy to see, gosh, like 15 years ago, VTrans or Vermont DOT engineer talk about this. The water flow in the spring in many of our mountainous states is much higher volume in larger pulses than it ever was because it's melting faster than it's supposed to. So as a result, that water coming down the waterway is scouring and destroying the supports for many bridges where their columns are right there on the edge or even in the river. So we're asking DOTs, when you replace that bridge, again, we go back to um, the, 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 the interstate system being made 50 years ago, we've got to start replacing all these different bridges and culverts. And of course, that's Build Back Better and the infrastructure law that's about replacing all these work with your Department of Transportation and say, listen, you need to plan for climate change or a key word in uh, the transportation world is resiliency. How can we make the transportation system resilient to the changes with climate and get longer bridges that also encompass more terrestrial pathways underneath so the animals can go underneath. That's one big way that climate change plays into what we're trying to do is get all these animals moving. The other thing is I just presented earlier today, New Mexico Wildlife Quarters Action Plan, <clears throat> we have maps of climate change. In particular, New Mexico and Arizona are going to get hotter and drier and have greater changes than any other state in the in two states in the, in the country. And so what's going to happen is your plains, um, your grasslands are going to turn into deserts. And so wildlife are going to need to move away from those areas to more moist places up in elevation and farther north. So wildlife crossings are important to keep those animals off the road. And I'll give you an example. In California, people, you can definitely talk about this when we have a discussion. When you have these great fires from the droughts, the animals are pushed out of their natural habitat, or they're just if it's just a drought, their water is no longer available. They come down to the roads to get to the next best place and they get hit. So I think California is seeing more black bear be hit. You'll see more ungulates getting killed, just trying to get a drink of water or find new habitat is cause climate change has created a process <clears throat> that's pushed them out of their habitat. So we're hoping that the structures that are getting replaced part and parcel of, of transportation can be de facto wildlife crossing structures to help them move around the landscape, both north uh, to more moist areas and up in the mountain ranges. It's very interesting. I'm glad that you kind of specifically said, where are we trying to get wildlife to go now that climate change is such a big factor? And, and that makes a lot of sense that water is such a big consideration. Um, I'm seeing the clock here. and I know other folks definitely are going to have questions. I do want to end on one question for you, though, about what we can do to get involved. You've sort of identified some different places and, and time periods in the planning process that are important, um, like when they're developing these infrastructure update plans. Um, but what are, whether it's local, state, national, um, what are some things that people can do to sort of get more of these structures implemented and more of these plans um, made? Great question. All right, there's four different kinds of organizations you can work with. You can work with all of them, but let me give you examples and then I'll go back and say how you work with them. You work with your DOT, you work with your wildlife agency, you work with your state legislators, or you work with the nonprofits who then affect policy change. So let's go back to the DOT. You let your local DOT people know that this is important and ask them for 
opportunities where wildlife can be included in future plans. With the DOT, you learn more about the process of planning. And for many years, we didn't realize in, in Utah that we were asking the project managers of a project to do something for wildlife. It's too late when it's a project. You need to go back into programming and even the director's office, write letters, show up at meetings, say, hey, let's start planning for wildlife in the STIP, which is the State Transportation Improvement Plan, the Long Range Plan. If you have anything to do with metropolitan planning organizations or regional planning organizations, get in there and say, hey, our transportation plans need to include something for wildlife. So the planning is really important if you're willing to, to go that route but also affect the engineers. The environmental people are great, but they, uh, they're they just a lone voice in the wilderness sometimes in a room of engineers. So if you can start to teach an engineer about how this is important, that would really help. The wildlife agency, let your wildlife agency people, particularly the habitat section, know that this is important to you and you wanna see something done. You need to keep up the pressure. They have to know that your voice is out there saying, let's advocate. Um, <clears throat> The legislators, I was amazed. Um, I was just telling Logan earlier, um, a state legislator in Utah had contacted me to try and understand how to work um, priorities for wildlife into the DOT methods. And again, you can't come with a club or a stick and say, you're going to do what I say. You come in and say, what are some of your upcoming projects? What are your priorities? How can we find ways to mesh? So work with your legislators to create legislation that gets the DOT and the wildlife agency working together and looking to do something for wildlife. And then fourth, um, work with the nonprofits or the nonprofits themselves can apply some of that pressure in a greater uh, way than so just a couple of people to let the DOTs know that this is important. I, I once sat in a room with Texas and um, at TxDOT has built very few wildlife crossings. And I said to them, who's pressuring you from the outside to do anything for wildlife? Because I'm not seeing a whole lot here. And they're like, nobody, we don't do anything for wildlife. Nobody asks us. So it made me realize the outside pressure is really important. And we learned that working in Florida too, that if we can support the people on the inside, things can get done. So there's many ways that you can have your many different skills to help wildlife with this whole process. It's a wonderful answer. And I, I appreciate you giving some very specific actions there. So hopefully folks have taken note. I certainly have. Um, and, you know, we're all in the position to do something about getting more of these structures around and, and getting these plans out there. So I think hopefully everyone has a, a way that they can now jump in. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. That was great to, to hear um, a little bit more about what you're working on and, and kind of what the history of all this is and where it's at today. Um, we're gonna now open it up for question and answer. So again, um, you can use the Q&A uh, function there and we'll try to sift through and get to everybody's or you can simply just raise your hand uh, and we'll call on you and you can use your human voice and, and say the question that way too, whatever you prefer. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chelsea, our office manager, and she's gonna manage some questions for us. Thanks again. Okay, we have some that have already popped up in the Q and A. Um, Grace asks or, or says that she supports the Center for Biological Diversity, and she received the figure that over four hundred and four thousand native animals in the U.S. were deliberately killed by wildlife services, and says, "Isn't this a shocking contrast to attempting to give wildlife various safety measures in their movements and migration?" Yeah. So, wildlife services is is a process that the fed the feds help kill carnivores on federal land that the public owns so that the people that are renting the land to graze their cows and their sheep do not have any um, possibility of those animals being killed. So yes, that, that service is such a contradiction to so much of what the rest of us do. And, um, you know, there's lots of ways to go to that. That's a little outside of my, my uh, specialty, but uh, having work at Utah State, there's a lot going on looking at non-lethal ways to keep the coyotes in particular uh, from saying reproducing too much or wanting to chew on a sheep. But yeah, that is, a, that is a, a grave problem on our public lands that definitely needs to be rectified, but um, I probably won't be addressing that in the next few years. Um, let's see. Um... Another question, grizzly bears are being killed by trains in the Rocky Mountain, like west 
um, area. Are you working on get to get grizzly crossings over or under train tracks? Another good question. So trains are pretty, pretty, pretty interesting because the companies that own the rail lines were paid by the United States government to make those rail lines. And they wound up having a sovereignty that they could do what they want, where they wanted with their tracks. And so we can't make them do anything. And um, it's very difficult to get the train companies to put wildlife crossings in. Um, they have done it in New Mexico. And some of the, some of the solutions are um, trying to fence this track area off so that the grizzlies don't come on them and get them to go underneath any kind of trestles that might be there. Another thing that involves our work a little bit is electric pavement. So we actually um, researched electric pavement um, in Utah and it was used and it is being used in Canada, in Parks Canada, so that areas where a road goes over the tracks and the fence has an opening for the, for the vehicles, the pavement is electrified and it's a negative, positive, negative, positive. And the soft padded feet of grizzlies, they walk on that, they get zapped and they turn around and run. And so it hasn't worked as well for ungulates because they have hooves. And my, my dog walked on one of these and he went yelping and he's an 85 pound dog. So it works really well. The electric pavement works really well for the soft um, pads of grizzlies. And that's one way to get them not to go on the tracks. Another great thing is um, one of my colleagues in in um, in, in uh, Canada. This was his um, life's mission to get the grain from being shed off of all of those tr those cars. So a lot of uh, wheat and corn went from the center part of Canada out to the coast. Um, and there's been a great movement to get those cars sealed up so they're not dripping grain all along and bringing the bears to the highway, to, excuse me, to the tracks. So it's a good example of being very creative when you've got an entity that's not necessarily willing to work with you. And then um, Ed also asked if you know if there's a person in Kenya, East Africa doing similar wildlife crossing work. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. There are great people. Um, so ACLIE, A-C-L-I-E, is um, a conference that started, uh, the, I went to the first one in 2019 in uh, Kruger in South Africa, and a lot of the uh, Kenyan people came, and there's people within the group, Sarah's, I can't remember her last name, um, is one of them. Um, yes, there's great people in Kenya working on these issues, because what's interesting in Kenya and Africa in general is that the ACLI conference, A-C-L-I-E, is about linear infrastructure, um, not just roads, but power lines and rail lines and gas lines, because we have a neo-colonialism going on in Africa where the, the European countries went and, and took all they could from the, the, the external areas of Africa that were easy to pull it all out. Now the Chinese are coming in and they're pulling the natural resources out of the center part of the countries and the continent, and they're pulling them out. And, and of course, a lot of animals are getting killed out, killed in those ways that they're pulling out the energy and the mining extracted industry things. So um, yes, Kenya needs a lot of help. Um, uh, please contact our, our organizers and I'll get you in touch with um, Wendy Collinson, who's my uh, friend and contact in South Africa. And she will definitely get you to all the Kenyans that are working on these issues. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Francisco asks, could you please speak to any experiences or research relevant to connectivity and crossings for carnivore recolonization in Midwest states that have mostly agricultural and private land, such as Iowa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's not a lot going on. It doesn't mean I don't know of it, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. But yes, um, I'm just trying to think. Mountain lions are a great, you know, flagship species for this. I'm thinking about the Black Hills mountain lion that went from the western part of South Dakota and was killed by a car in Connecticut. It went over a thousand miles for years, work walking through that whole Midwest area and winding up in Connecticut is an amazing story. Um, and so if we, can, if we can find ways to get the Iowa public excited about mountain lions coming into the, the state, black bears, the recolonization of these areas by wildlife that have been extirpated, um, you could get some more efforts, but I am not aware of, of Iowa, um, anything outside of the Dakotas, 
um, in the Midwest that's happening to, um, to rewild places. Uh, Dan asks, any statistics on how many vehicle slash deer collisions occur annually in the U.S.? Yes. Um, I had mentioned that earlier, Dan. You might not have heard it. Um, animal vehicle crashes per year that are reported, that's just a fraction of what actually happens, is about 347,000. There's a couple of factors you can multiply that by. Uh, a grad student that I work with who's now um, – a major wildlife ecologist in Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, Daniel Olson, found that 5.26 more animals were found in the right of way than were reported. So the Olson factors, at least five times more animals are killed than reported. Then in Virginia, the white-tailed deer are very numerous, and their maintenance crews several times have looked at the carcasses versus the crash reported, and it's anywhere from seven to ten times more animals are killed. So you can easily scale up, but I have, um, I have a, on my other screen here, I have the numbers from the DOTs, but yes, it's, it's, it's the deer are the majority of those animals that are killed. Um, let me just see, the deer are not gonna be quite as much as that because the animals include everything that I mentioned earlier, but um, definitely over 200,000 deer are killed in reported crashes alone. It doesn't talk about all those carcasses. Um, Michaela asks, how do you believe fire suppression has influenced the issue of water availability? Um, if you can give me a, if we can come back to this, if you can give me a geography, like what, what area of the country you're talking about, um, I'll understand it a little bit more, but I'm not sure the connection we're trying to make because there's so many different places in the country. So Michaela, let's come back to that. Okay. Um, Helen asks, or says an uncomfortable number of small vertebrates such as reptiles, amphibians, and small mammals are killed on highways, but drivers don't know, even know about these deaths. Has anything been done to help them? Yes, I am ashamed to say that I think I killed some toads last night and um, it was just really hard to see them last minute before I, and then swerving to avoid a toad that's like two or three inches was hard. Yes. Ontario is doing a fabulous job. The Northeastern states in particular are doing fabulous jobs for amphibians. They make crossing structures for salamanders. If you wanna take a look at um, a video of that, if you wanna um, go on YouTube and look on Moncton, M-O-N-K, like a monk, T-O-N, crossing in Vermont, they have a great um, salamander crossing structure. My colleague, Chris Lessar of VTrans um, helped get. Um, and then Ontario, what they do now, I, you probably, if you've been through with me with, for this past hour, I talked about mapping crash data um, to see where we need to put structures. What they do with smaller animals is you map habitat data. So in Ontario, they've done a lot of mapping of their, well, all of their turtles and their amphibians to see where the habitat, where those wetlands are bisected, not intersect, but they're bisected by roads. And then they start to put crossing structures in there because you can't count the bodies very well um, because they're so tiny. So when you have um, ephemeral wetlands and then wetlands where those animals have to come out of the water and lay their eggs in some kind of um, terrestrial place, turtles have to do it. And then of course, then the salamanders got to go into the water to lay their eggs. Um, those are perfect places for structures. Massachusetts has been the leader in this for a long time. They've got a lot of small and I mean, when I talk about a small crossing, I'm talking about a box this big, you know, like 18, 20 inches big in either dimension, all the way through underneath a two lane road to get these, these smaller animals through. So um, when you look in the Western states, um, California, Cal Caltrans can talk about an amazing toad crossing structure. It's, I don't know if you know if it's, it's, it's an elevated road. It's not a, a crossing structure to help get toads underneath the forest service road. So there's, there are amazing things going on, but you have to have special people and sometimes you have to have um, an endangered species status to get those animals something out there on the roads. Um, a question came in. What can be done for white-tailed deer and black bears on busy main roads in the suburbs? Mm. Very, very difficult. So let me think about black bear. Um, what our one of our challenges is is that when we have a fence to get the animals to go to existing box culverts and bridges 
there's got to be places in the fence where people's driveways and roads come in and let traffic through. Those egress and ingress, if you want to use the term DOTs use, those areas wind up being where the animals can access the roads. So you have to come up with double cattle guards, electric mats, gates, something to keep the animals from to getting into the road. Um, so it's very difficult. A black bear can walk across a double cattle guard. So electric pavement works for them, but then it doesn't work for the hooved animals. So it's very, very tricky um, because he, here's a, a really interesting thing about wildlife too. When animals are ubiquitous and they're everywhere, just like anything else, we don't value them. But if they become more rare, then we want to do something. So you've got a better chance of getting your DOT to do something for the black bear than the white-tailed deer because the, the deer are numerous and um, they're, they're not as important for these solutions. So you've got to get a little bit of fence, even if it's just wing fence, a couple, a hundred feet off the, off the structures to get the animals to find them and then they'll start using them. Um, but it is a very tricky situation. All right, we have three more questions. Um, first, Michaela popped back into the chat. Um, she said she's in California and that they, we know that suppression has caused the increase of invasives and native vegetation to the point where the environment cannot handle it. This uses up a large amount of water and keeps water from moving freely. She said she was curious uh, of your experience of how this plays into the situation of collision. Well, um, from my experience, but Caltrend people on the call would be great if there was any kind of interaction we can do with them. Um, they can talk more directly to California, but my experience has been when there's not enough water for the animals to get their daily water, they'll have to cross the road to go find water. Um, the other experience, of course, could be um, water can erode places or it doesn't flow in a natural progression, but um, I would definitely encourage the Caltrans people on the call um, to maybe talk about that or address what Michaela is talking about. Yeah, and, and if they have a comment, feel free to raise your hand and we'll unmute, unmute you and get you called on there. Until then, we can move on. I think we have a couple more questions here. Uh, yes, so we have, what do you think about animal alerts on vehicles? Well, I... Uh, I'll just say that if you think it works, go ahead. But the majority of our other researchers around the country and even in Europe and other places have found that it doesn't necessarily work. And the other problem that we have is habituation. So any kind of, I keep thinking about raising kids and being a teacher here, any kind of um, repercussions that we have for something, it has to come with a punch. It's got to come with something that hurts or leaves some kind of memory in the animal that, oh, this is going to, if I don't listen to this, I'm going to hurt. So if we have some kind of whistles or lights or warning device, either on the vehicle or on posts on the side of the road, if they don't pack a punch, the animals habituate to it. So, you know, it's great if you want to alert them that you're coming, um, but don't expect them to necessarily get out of the way if everybody's got whistles or if they hear you every day. So just, uh, just remember that they do adapt to sounds. Okay. Um, which then um, leads into the next question. Actually, it's the same person had was have pungent and or oily sprays or applications like that sprayed along sides of road stop road kills. Um, no, I, we, I've looked into this. In fact, when I was modeling the panther um, movement for my PhD, I looked into this and animal urine, because people like to talk about coyote and wolf urine on the side of roads. The urine lasts about five days. And if it rains in that time, it doesn't last five days. So you would have to continually apply urine or a smell, a yucky smell that you might want on the side of the road more than once a week. It would have to be every five days. So that's really time intensive. And again, it goes back to habituation. It doesn't pack a punch. If there's no, you know, you cry wolf and there's no wolf, it, they learn really quickly that it's more important for them to get to the other side of the road to go, go get breakfast than it is to worry about that smell. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. Those are some great questions too from the audience. So we really appreciate it. I do see one more that is probably quick, but I think would be great for folks to know. Are there any places where we can find more of your lectures or work so that folks who were um, fascinated by all this today can kind of learn more from what you've put out there in the world? 
I, I, yeah, I need to get my website up. So I create, I, I'm creating an institute called Wildlife Connectivity Institute. And um, so the website is wildlifeconnectivity.org and I have to upload all this information. There's a couple of different things you can do in the meantime. If you go to YouTube and you type in Utah Wildlife Crossings or Montana Wildlife Crossings, you can see some of the movies that we've put up on Robert Hamlin's channel, that's my spouse. Um, and you can see what we do is we link the pictures together and you can see a lot of animals going underneath the road um, in these crossing structures that really help help change transportation commissioners' minds and other people's minds. Um, that's one way. And then, um, as my cousin said, I Googled your name and there's a lot out there. So it turns out um, when I have given slideshows, people have taken the slideshows and put them on the internet. So if you Google my name in wildlife, there's a lot of women with my name. I die regularly. I always have fun reading my obituary um, because there's so many Patricia Kramers out there. Um, but if you put my name in wildlife, you'll start to see some of the things that I've worked on. And then um, certainly um, if you want to contact the organizers, um, they'll, they can give you my um, email address and I can send to you, especially if, um, if I've worked in your state, I can send you a link to my reports of what has been done in your state so that you can be up to date as to what's going on. Wonderful, thank you. And we'll also have the recording of this presentation posted and sent out to everyone afterwards. Um, you can also check back on our website for it if you want to review anything. And hopefully we can have Dr. Kramer back, maybe deep dive into something else at some point too and, and related to your work since there's obviously a lot we couldn't get to. So um, I just want to say thank you so much again, uh, Patricia Kramer for being here today. And uh, thank you everybody for attending. We hope you learned something new. Um, of course, we will always have more of these webinars and have a plan just as a little teaser um, for one related to mountain lions and climate change, both in um, geologic history or back to the uh, late glacial maximum all the way up into current climate change. So that's coming soon and something hopefully you can look forward to. Uh, with that, thanks again, Dr. Kramer. We, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come out and talk with all of us. And um, we hope you have a great rest of your day and, and all of your efforts to protect wildlife. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. And, and thank you for all the great work you guys do as well. Thanks. All right. Have a good one.